He walks out of his house and into the night. The darkness envelops him, hiding his intentions and helping him to seem almost like one of them. During the day, he works in homes around the area, laying tiles, smiling at his clients, making their houses beautiful. They could never guess that a man they've let into their house is a serial predator. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 161, The Serial Crimes of Elvis Zulu. This episode is sponsored by Lyft. I'm going to be traveling quite a bit this year for book launches and live pod events. And even before Lyft became a sponsor of TCSA, they were always my first airline choice. And it's not just because they have complimentary onboard snacks and free Vida coffee on every flight, although that is a huge plus. It's also their easy penalty-free fee changes and cancellations, because sometimes an extra interview opportunity or event comes up at the last minute and I have to change my flights. Lyft also offers flight discounts for kids under 12, which sadly I stopped qualifying for 32 years ago, but are super useful for parents, I'm sure. And there's a premium offering ideal for business travelers and frequent flyers alike. And as a huge animal lover, I can't help but be swayed by their policy that your small dog can travel on board too. Lyft is helping to take true crime South Africa to new heights. So visit lyft.co.za to view or book daily Lyft flights between Cape Town, Durban and Joburg. T's and C's apply. And a huge thank you to Lyft for your support of True Crime South Africa. Since 2019, True Crime South Africa has been telling the stories of the victims of violent crime in South Africa. The podcast is independent. That means no big or even little corporates fund it. And that's just the way I like it. And it's the only independent podcast in South Africa that consistently charts in the top 10. Keeping a podcast like this going is time-consuming. And for the most part, it remains a one-woman process. It's me. I'm the one woman. You? Yes, you. Are the reason this podcast continues to flourish and help bring in tips on missing person and cold cases. If you'd like to help keep the show running, please consider supporting our sponsors, signing up to Patreon or PayPal, follow the show on the socials, as the kids say, and share it with your fellow partners in crime. You can find our social links and learn more about our sponsors at True Crime South Africa forward slash donate. Shout out to this week's Patreon and PayPal superstars. A huge thank you goes out to Amy Garrick, Sav Rizzo, Vatiswa Jokazi, and Isabella McKay. Thank you so much, everyone. Your support really does make a huge difference. Patreon supporters get one additional exclusive episode a month, a shout-out on the pod, and other exclusive contents including Q&As with me as and when it's available. It's a minimum of $1 a month. I think you should do it. Please. And thank you. Keba. With our DNA database finally up and running and DNA testing starting to slowly catch up on the backlog, you may have noticed that we've seen a lot of arrests and convictions of serial rapists in the last few years. And I have no doubt that trend will continue if things continue to work as they should. But if you look at many of these serial rape cases that are now appearing in our courts, you'll see they have one thing in common. Many of the offences are not recent. 
Some of this is because of the usual delays in the court system, as is partially the case in today's episode, but a lot of this is a symptom of how deeply the issues with our DNA system have impacted ordinary South Africans. Women who have been physically and psychologically traumatized because the offenders who raped them were not put behind bars in time because the system was not working as intended. There are positive elements to to this and some of the other serial rape cases, which we'll get into in this episode, which show me that we as a society are perhaps starting to stigmatize rape less and education is making a difference. It is, of course, an education we shouldn't have to make. But it is our reality. My main source for today's case was the judgment in this matter, which is my preferred type of source, as I know the information is correct. I did read a few media articles on the case as well, but for the most part they didn't add anything new to my research. So, let's get into episode 161, The Serial Crimes of Elvis Zulu. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Due to this case involving the crime of rape, I will not be identifying the victims. That is usually a difficulty for me because it means I can focus less on the victims, and sometimes in these cases I have to then focus more on the offender. But in this case, we don't really have much personal information about the offender either, which is fine with me. I'll be using the initials that were used in the judgments to distinguish between each of the victims. On the 30th of January 2011, 26-year-old S.N. was walking in Pina in the Mpumalanga province of South Africa with the father of her children. He had collected her from her parents' home that night and they planned to head to the shops and then go to his house for the night. S.N. was already a little annoyed when her partner had collected her that night because she could see he'd been drinking and as they walked, they quarrelled over small things. By the time they left the shop with bread and slop chips, and he told SN to carry the items, their argument boiled over, and SN's boyfriend told her not to walk with him anymore. He sped up his pace, and she walked a distance behind him, their anger separating them momentarily. That moment was all it took. Out of the darkness, a man appeared. She recognised his face. She'd seen him in the area before, but she didn't know his name. The man asked if S.N. was with the man that was walking in front of her. She said she was. Before she could think, the man whipped a gun out of his pants and pointed it at her. Don't look at me and do what I say, he hissed. S.N. looked up the road, debating on whether she could get her boyfriend's attention without getting hurt. But as she watched his distant figure disappear into the night, she knew it was too risky. The man forced S.N. to walk into a nearby yard and into a pit toilet structure. There, he raped her for the first time. Bizarrely, After the rape, the man handed S.N. a second firearm, which he produced from his jacket. He told her to take it and shoot anyone that tried to stop them. S.N. had never handled a firearm. If she'd had to use it, she would have no idea how to. She knew very well that if she tried to use the gun to get out of the situation, she would end up dead. The man pulled her onto her feet and told her to get moving. 
He guided her to another location, this time an abandoned house, where he raped her for a second time. After that rape, he told her to lie on the bed and sleep. He sat in a chair nearby, his gun in his hand, and watched her. She closed her eyes and pretended to sleep until morning. The next day, the man took S.N. to a nearby taxi rank and gave her 20 rand. In shock and uncertain as to whether she was being tricked or she was really being set free, S.N. grabbed the money and jumped into the first taxi that arrived. She got off the taxi close to her boyfriend's home and ran there, but he wasn't home. She eventually made her way to her parents' house where she told her family what had happened. Her grandmother immediately told her not to bathe or change her clothes as her family comforted her and put her in the car to head to the police station. And it is this moment, this grandmother, who has learned, perhaps through her own horrific experiences in life, perhaps through some education campaign, that would help to secure justice for many more women to come and save countless more from the trauma her granddaughter had experienced. While doing research on this case, it was incredible to see how many people supported the victims of the serial offender and how they knew what to do. The terrible scourge of rape in our country is one we're struggling to get under control, but clearly the education is making a difference. Unfortunately, although SN was thankfully well supported by her family, the system was about to let her and many other women down. SN did open a case of rape and kidnapping that day. She was taken to the hospital and had swabs taken and was given antiretroviral medication. The man who had raped her had not used a condom, and so, although this meant they could get a DNA sample from her, it also meant he may have given her an STI or gotten her pregnant. SN gave the police a full and detailed report of what had happened to her. She also told them that although she didn't know the name of the man who had raped her, she would be able to identify him if she saw him again. Police promised SN that they would do their best to track the man down, and so her family took her home, and she left her trust in the system. Months passed, and there was no progress in SN's case. By May 2011, she was starting to come to terms with the fact that she would probably never see justice in her case, when the best and worst thing possible happened. SN saw the man who had raped her. Horrifyingly and quite by pure chance, she arrived at her parents' home, just as the man, who had been walking by, stopped and started having a casual conversation with her father. SN froze, immediately knowing it was him. She stayed where she was, hidden from sight, until the man moved on. Then she approached her father, telling him that this was the man who had raped her. Her shocked father reacted quickly, calling the detective on SN's case. Thankfully, the police officer was on duty and arrived within minutes, identified the man in question as one Elvis Aaron Zulu, and placed him under arrest. SN felt a sense of relief that she hadn't in months, but the peace was not to last. Elvis Zulu's blood was taken and sent for forensic comparison to the DNA sample that had been collected in SN's rape kit. While these results awaited confirmation, Zulu appeared in court and was granted bail. He was required to pay 1,000 rand in bail and he was released. And over the next two years, two timelines begin to play out. SN's case is continually delayed. She and her family attend each court session, 
and so does Alvis Zulu. It would later emerge that most of the delays were down to Zulu himself continuously changing legal counsel. He indicated that he would plead not guilty, as he claimed that he and SN had had consensual sex. But late in 2013, Elvis Zulu simply stopped attending court, and he disappeared. He would later claim that a court translator had told him that the judge had said he didn't need to come to court anymore, and they'd let him know if it was necessary again. This seems highly unlikely, but also it becomes clear that Zulu did not actually leave the area. So it's a mystery as to why he was not simply tracked down and rearrested for having breached his bail conditions. But he wasn't. And all the while, even from when he was first arrested in May 2011, that second timeline I mentioned was also playing out. Elvis Zulu had just continued on offending. Despite SN's bravery and the sharp thinking of her grandmother, and despite her literally handing the offender to the justice system on a silver platter, many more women were about to fall victim to him. Less than a month after raping SN, Elvis Zulu had offended again. NGM was just 15 years old on the 19th of February 2011 when she was walking with two of her friends in Pinar. It was around 7pm and as they were heading home she saw her boyfriend. Her two friends had headed off to their own homes and her boyfriend continued to walk with her so that she wasn't alone. As they walked, NGM's brother approached them and told her that her father was looking for her. He didn't seem to think it would be a good idea that his sister arrive home with her boyfriend, so the young man said goodbye and headed home. NGM continued on her path to her home, now alone, as her brother continued on his own way. The young girl was just a few hundred metres from safety when a group of six men passed her. One of the men hung back and asked her for her number. NGM told the man she didn't have a phone and tried to walk away, but the man was immediately upon her. He pulled a knife from his jacket and stabbed her twice on her arm. NGM started crying as blood gushed from her arm and the man held the knife to her throat, telling her he'd kill her if she made a noise. The man then grabbed NGM and dragged her into the bushes. There, he raped her. Afterwards, he again demanded that she give him her telephone number. She once again told him she didn't have a phone. The man slapped her and told her to get dressed. He then dragged her along back to the group of the other five men she'd seen him with before. All of them then walked together to an abandoned house some distance away from NGM's own home. There he raped her again on another three occasions throughout the night. The girl did not sleep, although her attacker seemed to drift in and out of slumber himself. She was unsure where the other men were, and she was too terrified to try and flee. Around 4am the next morning, the man got up and filled a basin with water. He instructed NGM to wash herself. She pretended to do so, but didn't actually wash her genital area, already knowing that valuable evidence could be lost if she did. She then dressed, and the man walked her outside. In the light with the man for the first time, She took the opportunity to study his features as closely as she could. She wanted to remember his face so that she could hopefully one day forget it. As quickly as the traumatic experience began, it ended. Her attacker walked away with another man and NGM walked in the opposite direction. 
It would take her three hours to walk home. When she arrived there, she immediately told her family what had happened to her and she was taken to the police station to open a case and the hospital to have a rape kit administered. And I must just pause here because although I think it's a good thing that the education required had reached this very young girl and she knew what to do after she'd been raped, it makes me incredibly sad that she knew exactly what to do. In the moment that she was violated by this offender, she understood that her body became a crime scene. He made it so. Of course, she could have chosen not to pursue legal action. That is always an option for survivors of rape, and it doesn't make their experience any less valid. But if NGM wanted legal justice, she knew that she had to override her basic instinct at that moment, which was to clean herself of what this predator had left behind. She had to acknowledge that her body was now evidence. And that horrifies me. And to be clear, the man who raped and kidnapped NGM was Elvis Zulu. He was, he was well set in serial predation, with NGM being his second victim. Or, at least, the second victim we know about. Shortly before Zulu was arrested for the crimes he committed against SN, he committed his third offence in this series. NNM was 18 years old when, on the 21st of April 2011, she wanted to buy a cool drink around 7pm that night, so she decided to walk just across the road from her home to a small kiosk and purchase a drink there. NNM had given birth the month before, and her baby had been delivered by a caesarean section. Four weeks into the usual six-week healing period, NNM was mostly mobile, but still healing. As she crossed the road, a man she didn't know greeted her. Because she didn't know the man and wasn't interested in getting involved in a conversation with a stranger in the dark, NNM ignored the man and proceeded to the shop, bought her drink, and turned back around to go home. As she did, she found herself facing the man who had greeted her and two other men. The first man was armed with a gun, which was pointed at her, and the other two had knives. The men dragged her to a nearby house and forced her to undress. The man with the gun who had originally approached her raped her first, and then one of the other men also raped her. NNM says that the gunman asked the third man if he would like to rape her too, but he said he wasn't interested. When the rapes were over, the gunman told her to get on her knees and pray until midnight. He said if she didn't do this, she would have to become his wife and accompany him while he broke into houses. NNM fell to her knees and began to pray. As she squeezed her eyes shut and mumbled under her breath, she heard her attackers leave the property. She was free and ran back home to her mother, who upon hearing what had happened immediately rushed her daughter to the police station. When she was taken to the hospital, she had to be booked in for additional care as the attack had caused her caesarean stitches to begin rupturing. It would become clear that Elvis Zulu was practicing what is called pseudo-relationship behavior with his rape victims. Either that, or he was simply trying to terrify his victims into silence, because shortly after the attack on her, NNM would have a horrifying experience when a child came knocking on the door of her home and told her that there was a man outside who wanted to speak with her. 
When NNM went outside, she found herself face to face with one of the men who had raped her. Now, what makes this even more terrifying is that NNM was not staying at the same place she was at the time that she was raped. She wasn't even in the same neighborhood. The rapist had clearly been stalking her. Frozen in shock and terror, NNM asked the man what he wanted. He asked her a few questions about why she'd moved, and when she answered as vaguely as she could, he turned and left. She immediately phoned her mother, who called a detective on the case, but by the time they arrived, the man was nowhere to be seen. Although NNM did not know the man's name at that time, she would later identify him as Elvis Zulu. Zulu would be arrested the following month for his attack on SN, but he would be released on bail not long after. The other women who'd been attacked by him so far had no idea that he'd been arrested, though. Although their rape kits had been taken and the samples were useful, they would probably not even have been processed yet by the time he was released. If they had, Zulu would have had multiple rape charges against him and it would be far less likely that he would have been given bail. And he would not have been out in the community to continue committing crimes, which is exactly what Elvis Zulu did. On the 10th of September 2011, RTK was 22 years old when she took a taxi from her home to her aunt's home to borrow 350 rand for food. While she was at her aunt's house, she packed a bag with some of the clothing she'd left there in the past and hid some of the money her aunt had given her in the bag. She hid the rest of the money in the cover of one of the cell phones she had with her. The other had been given to her by her aunt to take home with her. Darkness was already falling by the time RTK left her aunt's home. Her aunt walked with her to the street, and then RTK set off on her own, looking for a taxi. She walked for about 40 minutes before a taxi finally pulled over for her. It stopped quite far away from where she was, as the traffic was rather heavy, and before RTK could get to the safety of the taxi, two men approached her. One wrapped his arms around her, pretending to hug her. As he pulled away slightly, she noticed he had a gun in his hand. He whispered in her ear, If you don't do what I'll say, I'll kill you. The men then turned to the taxi driver, who was still waiting for RTK, and told him not to worry, he could drive on. The taxi driver seemed to sense that something was off, and asked RTK if she was really okay. She wanted to scream that she was not, and this man was holding a gun to her back, but she was too afraid, and hoping the pair would just mug her and leave her alone, she told the taxi driver, It was okay for him to leave. As the taxi drove away, the men instructed RTK to walk. They took her to a house that she said seemed to be used by people who use drugs because it smelled like urine and was filthy. The men demanded what money she had as well as her phone. She gave them one of the phones and part of the money, insisting that was all she had, but they went through her bag and found the other phone and the rest of the money too. The man with the gun became enraged and slapped her for lying to him. Then he told RTK to take her clothes off. She refused, and the man grabbed his friend's knife and cut her jeans away. He then raped her. Rather than ejaculating inside of her, He grabbed a shirt out of her bag and ejaculated into that. He asked his friend if he would also like to rape RTK, but the man said he didn't. RTK dressed herself again, holding her torn jeans up on her body 
and stuffing her clothes, including the sullied t-shirt, back into her bag before the men realised what she was doing. The man who had raped her then told her to get on her knees and pray. RTK did as she was told. She would later repeat her prayer in court. My prayer is that if you shoot me, please don't shoot me on my body, but on my head, so I die in peace. I also wish you let me know what my sin is, as you got everything you wanted in me. You took all I had and also violated me sexually. The gunman's friend pleaded with him to leave RTK alone, then told her to get up and run. As she did, grabbing her bag and running for her life, the gunman fired a shot in her direction. Thankfully, it hit the ground at her feet, and she continued running. Fueled by terror, RTK ran straight onto the busy road. Cars and buses hooted at her, but one man stopped and asked if she needed help. She quickly explained what had happened, and the motorist drove her to the closest police station. The officers took her report and opened the case. RTK was taken to hospital, and after the hospital staff told her that they couldn't locate any semen to sample, she remembered the T-shirt. The shirt with the rapist's DNA was removed from her bag and sampled. RTK didn't know the name of the man who had raped her that night, but her smart move in keeping the T-shirt which held his semen would later identify him as Elvis Zulu. In this second timeline, Elvis Zulu is still attending the long, drawn-out court dates for his rape charges with SN as the victim. He sits in court, often explaining the delays on his part because he's once again decided that the lawyer he's been given by legal aid is not good enough. He tells the court that he will prove his innocence in this matter in the end, but he can only do so with the right representation. And then he leaves, still out on bail, still living among his victims. And he continues to prey on women. On the 2nd of November 2011, 19-year-old T.L.N., was walking past a graveyard in Pinar just after 4pm when two men greeted her. TLN became immediately afraid when she tried to continue walking and one of the men grabbed her and told her to do what she was told or else. He produced a gun and the other had a knife. The gunman instructed her to undress, but she refused. He threw her to the ground and dragged her to a nearby grave. He pulled her pants and her underwear off and raped her. TLN would later tell the court that she had never engaged in sexual intercourse before she was raped. After the gunman had raped her, he asked his accomplice if he wished to do so. When the accomplice declined, the gunman raped TLN for a second time. After this, he started to insist that his accomplice kill the girl. The man refused, and the pair got into an argument. Tialen took the opportunity to dress herself during this time, and eventually the man told her to just leave. He did warn her, though, that he was a dangerous man, and he knew many people in the community. He said that if she told anyone what had happened to her, he would find her and kill her. Tialen did not know the two men, but one, the man who had raped her, would later be identified as Elvis Zulu. Tialen was also well supported in her time of crisis by her family. Her grandmother also warned her not to bathe as she would wash away the evidence and they'd taken several taxis to get to the police station 
and the officers transported Tia Len to the hospital to have a rape kit performed from there. From Tia Len's evidence, it seems that the more Elvis Zulu attended court for his initial rape charge, the more aggressive he became with his victims, and the more likely it seemed he was going to kill one of them. We've seen this before, of course. Rapists getting caught and being released and deciding that next time their victim won't be alive to tell the tale. Now, we may as well address this point now before going any further, because the accomplice, whether or not it was the same individual in many of these crimes, does really seem to have been the only thing standing between Zulu escalating to murder on several occasions. In a bizarre way, he seemed to be the voice of some sort of reason, albeit one who still stood by and watched women be raped and did nothing to stop it. In other crimes, the accomplice is more violent, less reasoned, and this was likely a different individual. Neither this man nor any other man, besides Zulu, I've mentioned in these crimes, has ever been identified. Only Elvis Zulu would stand trial for the series of crimes, and as he would always claim that none of this ever happened, he also never named anyone who could have been an accomplice to him. So, whoever these accomplices were, including the men who also committed rape, are still walking the streets. Elvis Zulu had seemingly not committed any other crimes, or at least none we know of, for the rest of 2011. Perhaps he, like most of the rest of the country, was spending December resting and with his family. Either way, by the 20th of January 2012, he was, once again, offending. On this day, 17-year-old T.S. had gone by taxi to her friend's house to help her braid her hair. She left the friend's house around 6 p.m. to head home and again caught a taxi. About halfway there, though, the taxi driver got a call that he needed to head in a different direction and he pulled over and told T.S. to get out. He said that another taxi would be coming by in just a few minutes and she could continue on with them instead. T.S. got out, and as she waited on the side of the road, two men called to her from the other side of the street. They told her to come across to them, but she declined and stayed where she was. The men became infuriated and ran across the road, hurling insults at T.S. She tried to flee, but they caught up with her and began assaulting her with beer bottles they had in their hands. One of the men pulled out a knife and started stabbing her in the head. When T.S. had submitted in terror and pain, the men had directed her to walk with them into a nearby cemetery. There, T.S. was robbed of a cell phone, a small amount of cash she had on her, and a jersey. Both men raped her. She was able to flee from the men after the attack and make it back onto the main road where a police officer stopped for her when she flagged him down. The DNA samples taken from T.S. would eventually identify Elvis Zulu as one of the men who had raped her that night. In 2013, Elvis Zulu stopped attending court proceedings for his initial rape case. By this time, likely due to delays in testing and an inability to easily link arrested offenders to current cases at the time, none of the additional cases we now know were committed had been linked back to Elvis Zulu. SN, the original victim who had been responsible for his arrest, was still battling the system on her own and most likely now wholly unsure as to whether she would ever get justice. Then, she would get the horrifying news that Zulu had stopped attending court dates, and the SAPS 
had no idea where he was. His lawyer didn't know either, and so began a very long wait for SN. The man who had raped her was nowhere to be found, and although it would still be far too long before he was eventually re-arrested, as is the nature of the serial rapist, he did not stop offending. On the 15th of November 2014, PSS was 17 years old. She was at a gathering spot near her home with a friend and her friend's boyfriend. The friend and her boyfriend decided at some point to leave and PSS remained behind, alone. She then chose to walk to her own boyfriend's house to see if he was home. While on her way there, two men accosted her on the street. One grabbed her by the neck and pushed her head down so that she couldn't look at them. The other pushed something into her back, which she soon realized was a gun. The men took her phone, which she'd been holding in her hand, and pulled her along with them. At one point, PSS managed to escape the men's clutches and started running, but they caught up with her and knocked her to the ground. The man with the gun held it to her head and told her that if she tried to escape again, he would shoot her. PSS decided it was safer to comply, and the men took her to an old tavern building, which had been turned into a church. The building was empty, and there, PSS was raped twice by the man who had held the gun to her head. Afterwards, she was told to get dressed and leave. She didn't ask questions, and quickly fled. Her boyfriend's mother took her to the police station after the terrified girl had managed to get out what had happened to her, and she was taken to the hospital. Although the young woman was given antiretrovirals, court records indicate that a few months after she was raped, she had tested positive for the HI virus. Now, none of these victims are required to declare their HIV status, and we have no information about Alva Zulu's status either. So, we don't know whether Zulu is responsible for passing on HIV to PSS or any of the other victims. There have been several cases in the past where individuals who were aware of their HIV status have been found guilty of various levels of crimes for knowingly infecting others. That did not happen in this case, so I can only think that either there was no proof that Elvis had been aware of his status, he was not HIV positive, or the prosecutor decided not to proceed with including such charges. Either way, PSS's case remained in limbo, along with all of the other victims. There are no more reported cases which match Elvis Zulu's M.O., or his DNA after 2014, but he was still out in the community. If we look at the consistency of the crime so far, the frequency and the similar MO, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that he continued to offend. A 2011 study estimates that only one in nine rapes are reported in South Africa. By that figure alone, we can be assured that there were many more victims of Elvis Zulu who chose not to come forward, and considering how long those that did had to wait and their experience of the system, I am not at all surprised. Elvis Zulu remained on the run from the law for another four years. He claims he was not on the run during this time at all, but working as a tiler in the community, running his own business, and simply believed that his case had been dismissed. There is no evidence that the SAPS did anything to track him down during this time. According to later testimony, Elvis Zulu's DNA began to be matched to additional cases outside of SNs in 2014. 
By this time, he had already stopped attending court proceedings for his initial case. All seven cases were grouped together at that time and handed over to a new investigating officer. But despite Zulu claiming that he had never been on the run, it would be the original victim in this series, SN, and not the South African Police Service, who would find him, and finally bring him to justice. On the 23rd of November 2018, SN experienced what perhaps is one of the worst nightmares of any survivor of violent crime. She bumped into her attacker in public. Despite seven years having passed since the attack and four years since she had last seen the man face to face, she immediately knew it was him. SN made contact with the new investigating officer on the seven cases against Zulu, including hers. She had made it her business to stay updated on the progress on the case, and as a result, knew who to contact to allow for an immediate arrest. And on that day, for the second time in seven years, the victim, the survivor, became her own protector and that of many other women, as she arranged for the arrest of Elvis Zulu. Elvis Zulu was charged with multiple counts of rape and kidnapping, as well as firearms charges. Miraculously, forgive my sarcasm, he was not granted bail. If SN and the other victims thought this would now be the start of a swift hand of justice, they would be mistaken. In 2019, the case was moved to the High Court due to the seriousness and magnitude of the charges against Zulu. Mind-blowingly, the case would be enrolled for trial and then withdrawn again six times before it eventually seemed it could begin in earnest. Then, Zulu played his hand in delays by changing his lawyers a number of times, and one of these attorneys also played a role in these delays by simply not arriving for court on several occasions because he had personal issues to attend to and hadn't thought to advise the court or his clients, allegedly. At some point in this chaos, Zulu had indicated he might want to plead in exchange for a deal but once the latter-mentioned attorney began his own unprofessional behaviour, Zulu seemed to change his mind. And eventually, when his trial began in 2022, he pleaded not guilty to all charges. Elvis Zulu claimed that SN was the only victim he'd had sexual intercourse with, and I say sexual intercourse and not rape, only because in this context he claimed it had been consensual. He said he'd been in a very brief relationship with SN, which had only lasted for that night. And as for the other six victims, he claimed he didn't know them. He'd never met them, he'd never had sex with them, and he hadn't raped them. His explanation for his semen having been inside the vaginas of the victims was that the police were clearly setting him up. They wanted a fall guy, he claimed, someone to blame for their inability to actually catch the real serial rapist, so they'd faked the DNA results. What Zulu could not explain when asked was why the SAPS would have selected him, of all the rape accused they had on file, to pin seven rapes to. The rape cases had also had different detectives originally assigned to them before the DNA had linked them all. Some were at different police stations. How then, the judge asked, could it be possible that all of those police officers, all of those police stations, and all of the forensic analysts involved would conspire together to pin these crimes on him? Zulu could not explain this, of course, but he said it was the only thing that made sense to him, because he was innocent. 
Six of the seven victims gave testimony at trial, despite the insane delays and all of the frustrations they'd experienced. One victim was in another country when the trial eventually happened and couldn't afford to travel back to South Africa for the trial. She'd previously given testimony in Zulu's bail hearing, though, so her written testimony was accepted because she did not specifically identify Zulu herself, and so no cross-examination was necessary. In addition to the victims, the prosecution diligently presented evidence proving the chain of custody of the DNA evidence from the point of it being taken in the rape kits at hospitals or clinics right up until the forensic analyst matched it to Zulu's DNA. Unlike many other serial offenders, Elvis Zulu did choose to take the stand in his defence. He indicated that he'd also wanted to call another witness who he said could attest to the one-night relationship he'd claimed to have with SN, but that man's memory was not good enough to be relied on, so he wouldn't be calling him after all. SN, of course, vehemently denied the claim that Zulu had made about her being in a relationship with him. She explained to the court that she'd been with the father of her children for many years before the attack, and was even up until the day she appeared in court, and she'd never been unfaithful to him. She quite rightly asked the court why, if she had had consensual sex with Elvis Zulu, would she have wasted the last seven years of her life trying to get justice. The judge would eventually agree with her, and told Elvis Zulu, as he found him guilty of all of the charges against him, that even his statements about having been in a relationship with SN showed that he had absolutely no regard for the concept of consent. I've spoken on this podcast before about the concept of consent within relationships, and I found this judge's statements about this so striking and so important that I wanted to share it with you. Judge Ratchivumo said, Quote, Even if the court was to accept the accused version of events, it lacks the consent part. Agreeing to be in love with a person does not entail agreeing to have sexual intercourse with him. Hence, even a spouse can be guilty of rape. This becomes more relevant for people who had just fallen in love minutes earlier and had never had a sexual encounter in the past. Nowhere does the accused version contain a talk about each of their willingness to have sexual intercourse without making use of protection, even though they were total strangers who didn't know each other's status in terms of sexually transmitted diseases. Before engaging in sexual activity with a woman you've just met that night, It is your responsibility to make sure she is happy to engage with you in a sexual encounter. One cannot just make a presumption in this regard. End quote. The judge was also clear and scathing in his assessment of how the cases had been handled by those who were tasked with seeking justice for these victims. Quote, It may be prudent to remark that had it not been for SN, this trial may not have taken place. For it was SN who gave identity and a face to a man whose DNA was to be found in so many women who simply couldn't identify their assailant. It was only after his blood was drawn that the DNA characters could be linked to other cases, including those to be opened in the future. End quote. And with that, Judge Rachipvomo found Elvis Aaron Zulu guilty of all the charges against him. In 2023, Zulu was handed down seven life sentences plus 83 years for his crimes. He will become eligible for parole in 2049 when he is 65 years old. For me, 
This case deeply displays the holes in our justice system when it comes to the investigation and prosecution of rapists. It is undoubtedly one of the main reasons that our rape statistics are so high in this country. It also makes evident the fact that authorities can no longer blame the victims for rapists continuing to rape. Although that was always a cop-out, if you'll pardon the pun. No longer can those with power say, if you don't report, we can't do anything, or you have to keep the evidence, because we are. Clearly, the vast majority of women, even from the young age of 15, are well aware what we need to do when our bodies are turned into someone else's crime scenes. Seven women reported. Seven women retained the evidence, even though everything in them was screaming to wash, to get rid of every trace of the predator. Seven women did their part, even though they should never have had to know how. But when the systems put in place to do the rest fail, miserably, at every turn, Clearly, that is the problem. If a speedy match had been made between the semen from the rape of SN and the accused, it is possible Elvis Zulu would not have been released on bail. If he had not been released on bail, or if the police had re-arrested him when he lapsed in attending court, at least six other women would have been saved the lifelong trauma of rape. And yes, I understand that individuals are innocent until proven guilty, and we cannot automatically assume that everyone accused of rape is guilty of it until due process is completed. But the data does not lie. And the data shows us that when individuals like Zulu are released into the community, they will continue to offend. Certainly, if you're going to hold someone without bail because of their possible risk to the community, then they should, at the very least, be given a speedy trial. Absolutely. There are too many cases where the onus is placed on the victim to resolve their own sexual assault cases. SN was able to do this for herself and at least six others, but she shouldn't have had to. And what if she hadn't? What if she'd simply not had the will to push on with it? How many more women's lives would Zulu have been allowed to upend by now? And for that matter, how many more predators, just like him, are out there right now? To each and every one of the survivors of this predator, both those who have been mentioned here and those who have never come forward, thank you for being stronger and more powerful than the predator who violated you. You always have been and you always will be. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on Spotify or the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Live Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then. Thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.